This is an honor. Uh, this is really an honor. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about um, my story. I'm going to use a lot of I statements when I speak. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is because I want you to hear my truth. I want you to hear my experience. I want you to feel my pain, feel my joy, feel all the happiness that I went through. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is because there's a spiritual concept called gleaning. And that concept means that as the harvesters went through and took all the crops, they allowed people to come behind and get from it what they, what they needed. Poor, or anyone could come back and get some of the harvest. And the reason why I'm telling my story is because I want you all to glean from it what you will. And I'm, I believe that everyone will get something different. My experience is that unsolicited advice can be at best a critique or at worst a judgment. So I don't want to stand here and tell you guys what you should do. I'm also going to let the scripture speak for itself. We're going to look at the word, and my job that I've been trying so hard to do is to let the scripture speak to you. And again, I want you to glean from it and get from it what you will. It's not what I have to say or what I believe or what I want you to understand. It's what Christ, literally Christ's words, that we're going to dissect. Um, when I was a kid, I always asked myself, a question, and I still ask myself this, this question to this day. Am I valuable? Am I valuable to God? Am I valuable to other people? And am I valuable to myself? When I was a kid, I put on like a filter, call it goggles. We'll call it this goggles the world's view. And that's how I viewed and that's how I valued myself, other people, through this world's view. Now, valuable people from my perspective as a child, did valuable deeds, they possessed the valuable things, and they were treated very specially. I had an uncle who uh, drove a fast car, he had a nice house, he had fancy things, and he would speed without consequence because he was a doctor. You know, the cops would see him and they'd be like, oh, we know who that is because he's got to go to the hospital. So it was clear to me as a kid, there's a value transaction here going on. If you have lots of value, lots of value is given to you in return. If I have lots of value, lots of money in, in terms of a salary is given to you. If I have lots of value, I get lots of privileges. If I have lots of value, I get lots of people giving me lots of esteem. So I sought to be more valuable. I was like, yeah, I want that. Sign me up for that. I definitely would like some of that. So I checked out many people around me through my world's view, and I would just sum their parts. Let's look at my uncle, for example. example. He's 6'5", he's handsome, he's got a cool accent, he's from the Caribbean. <laughs> he was a doctor who delivered babies. And as a kid who hadn't had the birds and the bees conversation yet, this was amazing. Like, wait, he's delivering, <laughs> bringing babies into the world? That sounds fantastic. He had a nice house, he had cool gadgets, he drove exotic cars, he drove fast, and money was flowing, cops knew him. I was like, okay, I, I see how this works. So I surmise that a person's value is the sum of their parts. I love this. I was like, okay, I got this. So to answer the value question, I was motivated to add more parts in order to be more valuable to God, to others, and to myself. So I looked at myself at the time. I'm kind of tall, kind of handsome, kind of cool. So I, I, need, I need an education. So I need to go to an elite high school. I need some, some traits, I need some, some, some clubs. I can sing, I'll join the glee club. I need a sport, I'll do track. I won't just do track, I'll be a record setting track athlete. I'll be a nationally setting rec track athlete. I need to be a good student. I won't just be a normal student, I'll be a high honor roll student. I need to be well spoken, well mannered. I'm just adding stuff to my, oh, okay, this is great. I'm, I see how this works. So when I looked through my world's view when I was a child, I looked into the mirror and I was like, look good, look good. This is great. So then it's time to go to college. Well, I need, I need an undergraduate degree. So I went to the best university, Princeton University. I, I, checked, I, checked, I checked, 15 years later, it is still number one. <laughs> I don't know if it was that way f last year, it still is. And I thought, okay, when I got to Princeton, I started to do something else. I started to compare my value to other people. I would look through my goggles at this person and look in the mirror. Look at this person and look in the mirror. 
And there were some times where I was like, mm, I feel, this is good. But there were other times I was like, whoa. Because in Princeton, I found myself, we were big fish in small ponds where we came from. And all of a sudden we got to Princeton, we got thrown into this environment. And all of a sudden we were just fish. And I wasn't used to that. So I decided to add more parts. That's, that's, my, that's how I, that's my, my worldview tells me, add more parts. Okay, we've got to pick a degree. Well, I'm going to pick a valuable degree. My parents told me, we would suggest you be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. Here's what I heard. You're not valuable unless you pick one of those three degrees. And you are less valuable if you pick something else. That's what I heard. I wanted to be the best track athlete. I wanted to come in my first year and break all the records and be the man. Because that would just be another notch on my belt. This childlike phase that I went through was about me focusing on the value that I produced for myself. It was about me just adding parts, summing them up. When I looked through the world's value goggles in the mirror at myself, it was no longer good because now I was in a place where it didn't look the way it did before. My world's view had failed me in my freshman year of college. My comparisons would oscillate between excessive amounts of pride or dangerous amounts of insecurity and adequacy. I did not like how subjective my value became. It depended on where I was. When I came home, it was like, oh, there's Adrian, how are you doing? Yeah, good job, well done. When I was in my neighborhood, it was like, there's Adrian, the black nerd, the blurred. So it also depended on who was looking at me and where I was. I didn't like that subjectivity. And then I found out that it never ends. I could continue to add. And at no point was there a point where it's like, okay, you're done. This is it. This treadmill just was driving me crazy. So my freshman year, I accepted Christ. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I realized that I was a sinner, that God loves me anyway and provides Jesus to take the penalty I deserve. I confessed my sin, I repented of them, and I surrendered my life to Jesus and put my faith in him. Done. I, I could walk out from here, right? You guys know that's not, that's not how it works. I still had the same value system. My goggles were still on. I still held that value the summation of my parts. I still believed that there's a, a value transaction, the more valuable I am is the more value that I'm, I'm given. And I was still trying to answer the question fervently, am I valuable to you, God? Am I valuable to other people? And am I valuable to myself? You might ask then, what changed when you became a Christian? Well, I just prayed to Jesus to get me better grades, to get me more money, to make me faster in track, keep me healthy, to get me that great job, that internship. And you know, sometimes it worked. Jesus, I, I left Princeton and worked at Crevasse, Wynn and Moore, which is the most prestigious law firm. Check that box, value add. I was given responsibility, I had a high salary, I was shopping with my, my girl, then girlfriend, now wife, then girlfriend. I was taking her out. I was driving a brand new BMW and I was taking vacations. I was like, well, this looks about right to me. Things are adding up for Adrian. I sought Jesus to increase my value to him and to others by continuing to add my parts. My college phase was about me focusing on the value that Jesus can produce for me. I sought him. Jesus make me more valuable by adding my parts. My look through my Jesus tinted worldview now, now there's a Jesus tint. Like it just wasn't clear anymore. It had a Jesus tint on it because I'm a Christian now, clearly. When I looked at myself in the mirror, it still wasn't good. I was still suffering from the comparison. I was still suffering from the subjectivity. I was still suffering from the unending treadmill. But now I was getting frustrated. I was getting really angry. Because every time I asked Jesus for something, he didn't give it to me. 
Jesus, you know how this works. Like, I need to continue to add parts to increase my value. So when I pray for something, I expect it. Yeah, Jesus didn't really take to that. <laughs> I didn't get the grades I expected. I didn't have the results at the track that I expected. And my social life wasn't where I was. I was usually the cool, I, it wasn't what I, what I wanted it to be. So I left my lucrative job in Manhattan and I joined the Christian Union. I was the first alum, yeah, whoop whoop, for sure, see you. Uh, I was the first alum to be hired at Princeton. As a result, I was shepherded. Matt Bennett and other people in the staff, they shepherded me. They, when I talk about scripture, they poured it into me. But the other thing that they did is they brought me alongside into a deep relationship. As much as it was work, it was also a deep, intimate relationship, and I appreciate that. But let's, let's be frank. This is someone looking at the world through my worldview. This was my ultimate value add, like, Jesus, come on now. You saw what I left. You see where I am. You make sure you give me a good check. But I was maturing in Christ, and it was amazing that the job, what the job was doing for me. But guess what? I still held the same views. I still continued to focus on Jesus for what he was doing for me. But again, you're asking, what changed? Now that you're maturing, now that you're a maturing Christian. Well, I was praying to Jesus to use me to bring people to him. Use me to preach great sermons. Use my tithes to build the kingdom. Use my talents and my passions for his glory. Increase my love for his glory. Increase my joy for your glory. Increase my kindness to be a better ambassador. And I think it's no coincidence that we had Dr. Smith come here before. My ambition, didn't, doesn't that sound right? but I was still seeking Jesus to increase my value to him, to others, and myself. My young adult life after the Christian Union was me focusing on the value could Jesus can do through me. When I look through now a matured Christian world view, because now it was, I'm mature, I'm getting older now. My glasses have changed. It's still the same tint, but I'm, I'm older now. It still wasn't working for me for the same reasons as before. But now it had gotten depressing, overwhelming, and terrifying. You see, Jesus does this thing where he calls himself the truth and the light. Hmm. So now when I looked in the mirror at myself, I saw all my appreciating parts. But now I saw some depreciating parts. I didn't like that. I was like, wait, 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 what, what is this, Jesus? Is that, is that sin? Oh, specifically, is, is, that, is that my addiction? Not just one, but two? Mm, no, that's not, no, 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 I'm not cool with that, Jesus. Like, that can't be in my mirror. Like, I don't want other people to see that. Are you, is your depression on there for my comparisons? Is my painful past coming back to haunt me and affect my present and my future? So all of a sudden, the mirror revealed a truthful inventory that I was absolutely terrified of. I'm used to looking in the mirror and seeing only value adds. But all of a sudden, now with my relationship with Christ, he was showing me, this is who we really are. I didn't know how to assess my value anymore. I was lost. My system was broken. Have you ever walked into a store with glasses like, okay, these just aren't working. These just aren't working. I need new glasses. So I said, all right, Jesus, I'm going back to the scripture to get a new value system. I need a new pair of goggles because this one right here is broken. I am at wit's end. I wanted the scripture to answer the question of my value. So I went to John 15, 1 through 17. I'm going to read this scripture because I think it's important just to read it. I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are, all, you are ready 
You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself and must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my Father, in the name of my Father, will be, will, my Father will give, to, will give you, excuse me. This is my command, love each other. This scripture really hit me hard in a good way. I was desperate to try to find a new system, a new way to view the world, a new way to value myself, a new way to answer my question, am I valuable to you, Lord? Am I valuable to others and am I valuable to myself? So the first thing I want to talk about from this scripture is in verse 1. Role, responsibility, and the authority of God. God in this scripture is a gardener. And it demonstrates God's control. It demonstrates his authority. It is, demonstrates his love that he would take care of, of, this, of, of the vine and the branches. It demonstrates the value that he has. Uh, can we go to um, the first picture, please? The first one. Thank you. This, because when I first read the scripture, I didn't know what a vine looked like. This is the oldest vine by the Guinness Book of World Records in the world. This is not in, in France. It's in Slovenia. And it is 400 years old. This vine still produces grapes. Can you go to the next slide, please? It's important to see that Christ is saying, I'm also the true vine. This is Christ's relationship with God. He's demonstrating all these things in the scripture. And I was like, okay, this is setting, this is setting up a good framework. I, I, I see where this is going. Can we go back to John 15, please? So we talk about fruit in, in verse 2. And I'll be completely frank with you. When I first read this scripture many years ago, I thought fruit was stuff that you did. How many people I brought to Christ, how much I was tithing, what I was doing, how I was doing it. But the word used in the scripture here, karpos, the Greek word, is used 66 times in the Bible. The vast majority of them is for internal stuff. Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Intro. Wait, what? I thought this was about all the stuff that I had to do to bear fruit. Why are you looking in here? Why aren't you looking at the stuff that I've done for you, Jesus? Stop looking at me. Look at the stuff I've done. Jesus is saying, this is the fruit that I'm talking about. 
The fruit is internal. I want you guys to see this next video. This plate. That's a vine, and they're pruning it. of the vine in a manageable form, we are going to cut off 90% of what grew last year and leave two canes to lay down for next year's growth. So, now when I looked at the word pruning, it means kathairo in Greek. It means to cleanse from filth, to make clean by purging, remove undesirable elements to eliminate what is fruitless, making unmixed. When I saw that video, I was like, what are they doing? Why are they cutting so much of the branches? They're going to kill it. That's too much. I mean, the guy took a saw to it. I mean, come on now. Seriously? It's just some grapes. It looked like a disaster. It looked like he was absolutely going to murder this, these poor vines. But it demonstrates the care of God and the trust of God that he would 90% in order, 90% of what? Of the fruit bearing part of the plant. He didn't even mention the stuff that's not bearing stuff, not bearing fruit. That stuff he's like, that stuff is automatically going to go. But the branches that are producing fruit, I'm going to cut 90% of that. Wait, what? In order for it to be more fruitful the next year? So I thought about this and I said, wait a second. If you cut off 90% of me every month, every year, every, what does that make me? Well, what I'm realizing is that the branch and the vine are becoming one. Where the vine ends and the branch begins are starting to blur. Did you see how big that vine was that was 400 years old? I couldn't tell you what was the vine or the branch. Here is where I went in to get a new pair of glasses. I went in to get a new pair of goggles. And I came out with a lot more. I wanted a new pair of goggles to filter out the answer, to get a better filter to answer the question of my value. And Jesus gave me something else. Can we go to the scripture in um, 2 Corinthians? Thank you. It says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Unveiled face. Take off your filter. Look in the mirror. Who do you see? Jesus. And we're being transformed into this image. I couldn't believe this. I was like, I've read this scripture so many times. I've read this scripture so many times. God, the gardener, is pruning the branch to become the vine. I walked in for a new pair of glasses, and I walked out a new man.
Can we go back to the, uh, the John 15 scripture, please? Jesus is not trying to improve the qualities of my life. He is not trying to give me more joy, more peace, more love, more forbearance, more kindness, and more goodness. He's not trying to give me more. He has come to give me His. Verse 4 says, remain in me as I also remain in you. That word remain, the meno, in Greek means to stay, to abide, to endure in Christ. Jesus says in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Hmm. Jesus said in verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. As you love each other, replace that with how I love you. Verse 13 and 14, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Whatever I thought about friendship, that wasn't it. And that's what he's given me. Verse 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. All that Jesus learned from the father. Now I get that. Again, I was like, wait a second, how does, this, how does this work? I just wanted more. I just wanted better. And you're giving me you? Yours? Well, when it came to answering my value question, I was blown out of the water. Verse 1, the gardener, he's taking care of me. He is pruning me. He loves me. You see these guys in that picture. They are clipping. They are mending. They are twisting. They are molding. They are taking care. I'm valuable to Jesus. He's pruning. He's cutting. He's cutting big parts, little parts. He's sawing. He is twisting. I'm valuable to Jesus. Remain in me as I remain in you. He wants to be in me? I am valuable to Jesus. He wants me to be connected intimately to him like a vine is to a branch. Everything that I get comes from him. Yeah, I'm valuable to Jesus. My purpose in verse 8 is to glorify God and show that I'm Jesus' disciple. I'm valuable. God's love for Jesus now becomes Jesus' love for me in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Wait, the way that God loves Jesus is the way that he now loves me? He loves me like, like that? I'm valuable to Jesus. He gives me his joy. He gives me his love. In verse 14, he calls me his friend. I'm valuable to Jesus. Verse 13, he's laying down his life for me. He gave up his life. Wait a second. I'm valuable to Jesus. What I recognized is that what now I was seeking to be more valuable incrementally, by adding my parts, Jesus scrapped it and said, I am in you, you are in me. My value is now your value. I now have the most infinitely valuable thing in the entire universe living within me. When I look in that mirror, I see him. 
wait, what? This is not what I expected. But I'm so glad that Jesus does not do what I expect. The world's value says, I am valuable as the sum of my parts and as valuable as I compare to others. Jesus' value says, I am valuable because he is in me and I am in him. Jesus did not come to improve my life. He came to change it with his. So what does this look like? What does this look like? All right, veil is off. I look in the mirror, I see Jesus. I'm being transformed into that image. What does that look like now? Because for me, my whole life was based on increasing my value and comparing my life to others. Now all of a sudden, I, am, I have the most valuable thing ever, 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 that loves me dearly so much, and now it is in me. And now I'm supposed to, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, it changed the game for me. My primary motivation was no longer to seek value. It was to live in the value that he gave me. Can we look at Philippians 3, please? Now, Paul, in this scripture, is doing what I did on a level that I could not do it. Paul was doing a value of, of his parts. Paul said, Let's look at verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day a peop of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul was saying, when you looked at my sum of parts, no one compared. But verse 7 makes it clear what, we, what I now do in light of my new value system. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith. In Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul is saying ex exactly what Christ has been trying to tell me the whole time. All of that is garbage. In comparison to what I'm offering you. And why is it relevant for this audience? People out of those walls look into these walls and say, those guys are the most valuable people in the world. They're going to be the leaders of the world. That's what the Christian Union says, right? That's why this ministry is so valuable. We, us, this ministry touches the individuals who will eventually and have the potential to be humongous and powerful leaders in this world. Valuable. But imagine if we went up and said, my value is in Christ. So for me, it changed my world. My health, I had a hard time two or three years ago consistently working out as, a, as an athlete. After I left track, there was probably about six, six good years where I was just living off of four years of running track. I thought, oh, this is good. I'm not going to ever get fat or lose, you know, get out of shape. Yeah, no, no, that, that happened <laughs> because I just got older. And I had a hard time getting back into it. Why? Because I had a, my value system was broken. But something happened. I struggled. Something happened with that change where I now work out three days a week. Consistently. It's because I'm taking care of his temple. I look forward to getting up and taking care of I have a family to take care of. I, I have re it's no longer about value. It's about I'm living in him. And I'm just taking care of what he's given me, and I appreciate it. I mentioned to my addictions. This was a real thing for me. I was sharing it with the group at lunch. I'm 320 days 
and 350 days sober for my two addictions. Thank you. I'm going to be very clear and very frank. It is not my sobriety. One of those fruits of the Spirit was self-control. What I have now is not mine. I worked mine out. I tried my way. Ups and down, ups and somehow, some way, I'm about to celebrate a year. That is not mine. I know. I am just so grateful that when he says that I'm trying to bear, he's trying to bear fruit in me that will last. I am so grateful that my daughters will only know a sober father. This year I celebrate 10 years of marriage. I am so grateful that my wife for nine years loved me. I am more grateful that she, God willing, will enjoy many more years of a husband who is engaged and is free. Jesus gave me a new level of vocation and purpose. You see, on my value system, I needed to add more parts. But right now, I, I'm a stay-at-home dad. Wait, what? Yes, happily. I'm investing in the two most valuable investments I could have made. I get the privilege to do that. But I could never have, I, you, you heard my story. If I'm valuing parts, it, it does not add value to me to stay at home when I could be out making a lot of money, doing a lot of big things, blah, blah. It is not my purpose and vocation that is in me. It's his. And I'm a full-time stay-at-home dad. I'm a part-time entrepreneur and consultant. He gets done what he needs to get done on my part-time. It, it happens that way, and I am so, my little two little girls and my wife, they love it. I put my wife's career above my own. Now, I hope you guys don't think that, oh, he would have done, no, if this was me, if this was my way, and my wife said, I want to go to business school, and you have to take two years off, that, in my system, does not make sense. It's like, no, you sit down while I go out. But it's him in me who says, no, you put your wife first, let her go first. Let her get those two years. We moved from Silicon Valley to Raleigh. I had lucrative, I'm a tech consultant. I moved away from the tech capital of the country. Why? Because my daughters needed to thrive and survive in Raleigh. They would have had a hard time in Silicon Valley. It was way too expensive. I would have to work way too, in Raleigh, Things just make sense. We have family, cost of living is great. In terms of finances, I was, I was praying, God, please change my finances. Make me a better manager of my money. He didn't give me a, make me a better manager. He made me his manager. I became, he gave me his way of doing finances. And my wife and I are on a path of becoming debt free. I'm praying that I have enough money for my inheritance to be for my children's children, as it says in the Proverbs. And just Thursday, I sold my dream car. <laughs> my parents are laughing because they know it was my dream car. And I sold it. I give up things I like for things I love more. 